Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go ahead and get your Bibles up. And we're, we're, um, uh, last week, we started in, uh, got to some places. We're going to have to kind of maybe recap or go around and, and, and whatever. Talking about the Church of Acts. And uh, we, our question to you is this. The Church of Acts, is it the church of today? Now, I want to read something to you. Um, Y'all know who Randy Greer is. How many know who Randy Greer is? And Brother Randy, um, a few years ago, coming up, he said in 2011 there would be a divide in the church. And, um, And boy, was he accurate. And it wouldn't be a divide, it was going to be a divide called, he called it the information, I forgot the other word he used, it was a second name for the, the church that staved the things of God, there's going to be the informational church and something else. And I, and I just can't remember what that word is. But I want to read you a post he put on Facebook yesterday, because it ties into what we're talking about. He said, the ungodly revolution of this era began in 2006. The church was warned about this. But many failed to heed the warning or were so lukewarm they did not hear. Jesus told Peter, Satan has desired to have you so that he may sift you as wheat. The sifting is to tempt and test the Christian so deceptively that they disobey the Bible and ultimately reject Jesus Christ. By 2008, the church had entered an identity crisis. Most of the church could no longer define the word Christian. The world demanded that the church become more tolerant to sin and forced it to put away most of the Bible. Scriptures on love and grace were accepted. Now listen, in, in a unbalanced way. Okay, that's what he's trying to say. Scriptures on love and grace were accepted and many in the church accommodated the world. In other words, under the guise of love or under the guise of grace, we, all, we became tolerant to sin instead of living a holy life in the church. Now look, when the, book, when, the Bible, when the church first started, you told a lie, you fell dead. A lot of people call it a white lie. Hello? Had two of them fall dead right out of the gate. Did you sell lamp so much? Yep. Why did you lie to the Holy Ghost? Boom. Wife comes in three hours later. Did you sell for so much? Oh yeah, we sold for that much. Why did you... Why did you I let Satan tempt you to lie to the Holy Ghost with your husband. The same feet that just took him out and buried him going to take you out and bury you. Boom. Now we got homosexuals preaching. In the pulpits. Something's wrong. There's not enough fire in the church. People flock to hear the new Christianity with glee. Now, 10 10 years later, in 2016, the sifting of Satan has accomplished its mission in most of the church world. Some have awakened to the fact that the nation, world, and church is in a diabolical cesspool of evil. Others have no clue. Transgenders, homosexuals, lesbians, pedophiles, adulterers, rapists, liars, thieves, and all other types of sin um, can can declare that they are Christians without being born again and changing their lifestyles. Note, God created male and female only according to the Bible. Those who claim they are transgender, homosexual, lesbian, pedophile, adulterer, and all other sins were not created by God. It is a demon spirit that has or will possess them and eventually take them to hell unless they repent of their lifestyle and accept Jesus Christ. And, of course, when you say that, you're a homophobe. I, I don't really care what you call me. You know, you're a truthophobe. If the church tolerates sin, it would allow sinners to go to hell from the church. Think of the consequences of standing before the head of the church and the head of the church pointing and saying, they were in your church, they went to hell because you preached that their lifestyle was accepted by my love. And you have to answer for their blood. You think it's cool that you got your Mercs and your, your Mercedes and your Beamers and your high-end cars and your hand-tailored suits and you're living in a fancy house and you're writing books and everybody's buying them, but you still got to stand before the judge, the head of the church. 
And I don't want to stand before the head of the church and have him say, they went to hell, their blood is on your hands because you wouldn't give them the truth. Ever say amen, oh me, or help me Jesus. And that is the truth. Love does not condone which God abhors. We are to love God but hate sin. Notice how sexual sin is dominant in society and it has destroyed many nations in history. Love tells people the truth about their sin. It does not let them go to hell without warning them of their error. Jesus has prayed for us all that our faith will not fail. May we all follow the example of Peter and repent before it is too late. Now that goes along with my sermon in, a, in kind of a way. Because you see, the church of Acts was birthed in fire. And we talked about this last week, that God the Creator created men supernaturally. The church was born supernaturally. Everything God does is supernatural. Even when he's dealing with the natural, the supernatural. Amen? And how that man fell, and man, man rebelled against God, and man went against the plan of God. And, um, you know, our beginnings were in, in that. The church birthed in that. The book of Acts is birthed in that. Let's talk about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus did not have a wimpy ministry. Jesus had a supernatural ministry. Hello? He didn't just look at people and go, I'm going to make you sick, but you still need to believe. And just trust I know what I'm doing. Mark Brzee said one time, I was, he was preaching in the church and I know he said it other places, but he said it in our church for a time. He said, healing is the dinner bell of God. Amen. Think of the, how many people came to the kingdom because of the healing revival. Think of people who followed Jesus because he went right out of the villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness among the people. Acts 10, 30, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Amen. We can't find a single case where somebody came to Jesus and he refused to heal them. Uh, the Syrophoenician's woman who was vexed for the devil. And he said to her, he said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. He was using covenant language. It's not right to take covenant blessings and give it to people outside the covenant. And she said, yeah, Lord, but even dogs get crumbs. What did he have to do? He had to find out where she was in her faith. Even the dogs get the crumbs that fall off the master's table. Great is your faith, be it unto you, even as you will. She still got it. I said, she still got it. Even get, you know, she could, she could have done like most Christians would have done today. Gone and wrote a song. He called me a dog. I can't stay in the church. The church hurt me and I can't go to church anymore. Elvis made that fun. Famous. All right. Really? People going to go write some song. And, and, and the new thing is everywhere you look, uh, everybody's apologizing because the church has hurt people. The church has hurt people. Everybody got hurt at the church. Now, what, probably 99% of the cases, they got told the truth. And they didn't want to hear the truth. So they hurt. We didn't have a psychological uh, group session. Everybody would just sit there and whine and cry about their problems. Group, listen, that stuff don't work. Why? Because all the people, the, the, the vast majority, I won't say all, the vast majority of people I've ever met that did that kind of stuff were still not right. We need supernatural help. We need a supernatural church. We don't need Mickey Mouse sermons. We don't need placating everybody. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost in the church that will burn in the people's hearts. Hallelujah. I remember the two disciples that were on the road with Jesus after his resurrection. And then they all of a sudden knew who he was and he disappeared. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he unveiled and revealed the scripture? We need a fire, a rest, fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost in the church. 
They would go out and they'd get wore out and they'd be in all kinds of stuff and they'd run back to their own company and then the fire would fall and it says and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they, and, and they went out and would they what, preach the word of boldness. <laughs> Is there any water floating around out there anywhere? My family has a, has a cup with water in it or sweet tea from Bojangles. Hallelujah. God called us and baptized. And remember this. John the Baptist said, He that comes after me is mightier than I. So he, he said, I indeed baptized with water. He did. He baptized with water. But he that comes after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We've put the fire out with man programs. We put the fire out with man ideas. We put the fire out with complacency. We put the fire out trying to be cute. We put the fire out trying to do, do a world method to do a supernatural work. But I've got more people in my church. I don't care. If all you're doing is filling up the seats and you're not filling them up with God, you're not doing anything. It's going to take more than a rock climbing wall and a seeker sensitive narrative to reach the world. It's going to take the power of God. Men and women full of faith. You couldn't even go feed the widows without being full of the Holy Ghost. You couldn't show up at their house to change the screens unless you were full of the Holy Ghost. Now we send them over there to listen to the gripe session. Pastor this and pastor that. Oh, Pastor Ed, Pastor Ed I really love him, but. <laughs> Big butts. <laughs> Did you say that, Ellie? It just kind of came out, didn't it? Yep. Cotton. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We're just going. I'm glad Nathan's down in here right this second. Can he jump all over and take it to another level? What has happened to the church was prophesied. Randy Greer. Now, listen, I, I, some, you know, I don't care if you like him or not. I'm telling you, for four years, I mean, he preached it in our church. There was a coming divide in 2011 in the church. Thank you. Oh, that's cold. Someone went and spent some money. Whoever will thank you. That's why I said somebody spent some money. came out of the machine. <laughs> now you got to go blob that out because we're infringing on copyright. <sighs> What's happened in the church? We bought the lie. Satan offered a carrot. I won't use that word. I don't know what other word to use. Satan used a carrot to castrate the church of its power. To rob the church of walking in its authority, walking in the glory of God, walking in the fire of God that convicted the hearts of men and women. Instead, we've offered, we, we advertise, we drink wine, and we, you know, we're under grace, and we don't have to do that. And, 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 and men and women are going to hell, and they're excited they can go to a church and drink. Stogie and rum leadership meetings or men's fellowships. Because they can be cool. I can still go to heaven and do that. But how many people are going to hell because you did that? Because they couldn't receive your testimony. Now that's the question you'll have to answer to the Lord. Just stand up. Wave your hand and say, preach, Pastor. You got a hanky? Oh. Okay. Too much. We, we've 
diverted so far from being the church of Acts that the, peop we, that the people in Acts wouldn't even know we're Christians in most of our churches. Listen, we're saying it's okay to have a transgender, lesbian, homosexual, whoever in our churches and, and, and lead it. Paul took one guy who was sleeping with his stepmom and threw him out. Not only did he throw him out, he turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Don't sound like he just walked, well, ah, we love him, just put your arms around him and tell him you love him, he's under grace. He said, I'm, you've let this go on, you're, I'm going to paraphrase, you're wrong, and so I'm taking over and I'm judging. And then later he writes and says, receive him back, lest he be overcome with much sorrow. In other words, I, th th it worked. He got it right. He turned around. But Paul said, I'm turning him over to Satan. He's going to destroy his flesh because if he keeps going down that path, he's going to hell. There's no authority. Listen. We talked about this, We said this earlier. First thing that happened in the church was Ananias and Sapphira fell dead for lying to the Holy Ghost in front of the church. And all they did was lie. Hello? Hello? There's no fear of God in our church. There's no awe of God in the church. There is, we've lost it in the church. But I am telling you, I, we're not going to be like the prophet who said, I and I alone, Elijah, am left. And God said, I have reserved unto myself 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Hallelujah. And I am telling you that there is a supernatural remnant in the body of Christ who will not bow their knee to the ways of the world, will not bow their knee to the sin of the world, who will say, Holy Ghost, fill me up again. Fill Holy Ghost, let me be birthed again in fire. Let me be used of you supernaturally, praise God. Let the power of God fall on me. Hallelujah. Let it burn in my bones like the prophet said. It's fire set up in my bones. Glory to God. And go to the world with a message of deliverance and freedom that sets the captives free. Not damns them to hell by saying you're okay, I'm okay, and singing the Barney song. I love you. Blaine's well, got on purple. You love me. We're a happy family. With a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? That's a cute kid's nursery rhyme. But when we use that narrative and that mindset in reaching people. Instead of coming in the power of the Holy Ghost. Where they're convicted of sin. Not condemned but convicted to turn and come with Jesus. You're going down and going to sit down and drink a, a, a long neck with them. I'm talking about, I ain't talking about a long neck sun drop or a long neck Dr. Pepper. I'm talking about a long neck Bud or Bud Light or whatever else, Coors or Schlitz, malt liquor or whatever else is on the market. And you're going to sit down with them and show them the love of Jesus drinking with them. And they talk about how cool of a Christian you are. Some guy said he sat down and smoked a cigarette with a guy the other day because he was going through a hard time and they just sat down and smoked together. Jesus ate with the publicans and sinners. He didn't act like publicans and sinners. There's a big difference. And they welcomed him because he did come and eat with them. He broke bread with them. But he didn't act like them. He was still the son of God. He was still dressed in his rabbinical clothing. Why? Because you go everywhere, even the sinners called him Rabboni, teacher, master, teacher. He was dressed like a teacher. He wasn't dressed like the world. He didn't gauge up and cut holes all in him and everything else. He didn't try to be the world. He brought the answer to the world. He brought help to their most dire situations. And in the darkest hour, he was the light. But he wasn't them. He was what they were to become. 
big difference. God's called us to be the answer and not the problem. God has called us to show them what they are to become, not to be like them. In compassion and love. Hello? And I'm, listen, the world demanding tolerance, that's the world. The church demanding tolerance is the devil. Are you here? You, what do sinners do? They sin. What kind of opinions do sinners have? Sinful. Why? They're not born again. Their mind hadn't been renewed. But when the church stands up and says, we have to tolerate this, we have to tolerate that, that's the devil. Why? Because we're cutting off from the world the image that God's called us to be so that they can follow after it. The disciples, I, I looked through here, and they were first called Christians at Antioch. It meant they looked so much like Christ. They acted so much like Christ, they said, you're Christ-like or little Christ. You act just like the one you're preaching about. They won't lighten up a bong and going, well, man, you know, if you'll, you know, I'll smoke a bong with you, lead you to Jesus. Then you come up with stupid stuff so stupid that men and women, a man and his wife are having swinger parties where they're switching partners and having uh, sex with them and then leading them to the Lord. What greater way can you show the love of God than to have sex with somebody? When you get out of the plan of God, there's only one way to go, and that's the plan of man. And that plan will be earthly, sensual, and devilish. So what are we to do? We're to follow the pattern of Jesus. Jesus healed their sick. Jesus raised their dead in John 12:1. Um, over in, in, in Mark 16, 9, it says he, Mary Magdalene was with him, whom he had cast out seven devils. That woman had seven in there. And we know one of them was a ratchet devil. Who? Oh. New term is ratchet. Yes, if you just get y'all updated, ratchet's the new term. Okay? Used to be skank, now it's ratchet. Maybe something else next. She had, she had one of them kind of devils. Six other kinds. We don't know what those six were. She had seven devils. We ain't got preachers running around don't even believe there is a devil. My wife knows someone's a pastor's, pastor's wife in a traditional mainline denomination. Don't even believe there's a devil. Poor Jesus. He went around casting out devils, told the church to cast out devils, told people to cast out devils, and there ain't no such thing as a devil. Yeah, I'll stay with Jesus. Jesus even overcame the forces of nature. Walked on the water. Remember, he was walking on the water. He sent them on the other side. He was walking on the water over in Matthew 14. And then they look out at, at, at one day, fourth hour or whatever. There he is walking on water. They're all, they're all upset. It's a spirit. Jesus said, don't be afraid. It's me. Peter, Peter's always quick to speak and slow to think. Master, if that's you, he's already told him it was him. Bid me come on the water to you. Jesus is limited. He was kind of limited in options there. I'm, I am Jesus. Come. Peter walked on the water until he, got, he started looking at the circumstances. That's another sermon. Like Ed Elliott said one time, he said, Jesus did not grab Peter and drag him back to the boat sweet, drinking water. Well, 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 come on, Peter, you, you doubting, unbelieving rascal. Picked him up and they walked back to the boat. But Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. He overcame the forces of nature. Did you know if you go through the book of Acts, you'll see the church doing the same thing? Acts 28, 8, remember Publius? His father was sick with, with, a, with a, a fever, and, a, and, and the Bible, I think King James says bloody flu, if you all, but it's not dysentery, but a bloody flux. It was dysentery. It was what they, they believe that's what it was. He, he went and healed him. After that happened, everybody on the island came to get healed. Now, let me say this. I chose Acts 28 as the scripture, because that's the last chapter we have in the book of Acts in the Bible. To show you, they didn't stop walking in the supernatural by the time we got to the end of the book of Acts. They were still doing what God called them to do. 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. Not the first century apostles, not the apostles of the Lamb, but believers. Amen. But believers. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They'll speak with new tongues. Amen. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The church is to walk in the supernatural. I think what we've done, and you know, even in our, our church, you get, you get so used to kind of being a Christian that we forget where we're supposed to walk. Well, that's pastor's job. It's not pastor's job. You're encountering people every day I will never see. Or I will never see until you get them to Jesus and, and you bring the power of God to them and they come to church. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you to lay hands on them. They're waiting for you to bring the gospel to them. You're going to be standing in the grocery store line. Somebody's going to tell you, man, I feel lousy. And you're going, uh-huh. In the name of Jesus. Do you mind? Can I, I, I'll pray for you. Thank you. They're thinking you're going home. And give some Mickey Mouse little, Lord, heal that woman I saw in the grocery store line today. Get your hands on them right then. You might, have, I, you might offend somebody. They'll get over it. They'll go home and post stuff about you on the internet and say there's some crazy person praying for people in the grocery store line today. I mean, that, there, was a, there was a woman in there with blonde hair, and, and, and she, they called her Dot. And she laid hands on somebody in the store line today. I'm so offended at these Christians thinking they can shove their religion down our throat. They won't pray for you. That person needed prayer. Don't you worry. You're going to be persecuted. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, Jesus said. They persecuted Jesus. But if I walk in the power of God, everybody's going to want to follow me and love on me. No, they won't. They took Jesus and tried to throw him off a cliff one day. If you look at the ministry, it wasn't all hunkadory. Hello? They showed up, throw them off cliffs. Hello? Going to stone a woman right in front of them? Amen? I'm telling you. Jesus got persecuted like crazy. Paul and those guys went one place, said one thing, and the whole city got in the uproar, was ready to kill them. And the only thing that saved them was Paul told the, the, the guys, the, the, the Roman guys that came to him, I'm a Roman. They got him out of there. Because you know, that citizenship, Paul, Paul used that trump card occasionally. It was, I'm a Roman trump card to get him out of trouble, but that's all right because he had a mess until he got to Rome. Amen. Be careful what you do is to him. This man is a Roman. Man, I had to pay a lot of money to become a Roman. How did you become? I was born that way. That's even better. He had the whole city in an uproar. I mean, for three hours, they, they, they had a hissy fit over the goddess Diana. la di da And it was all done. Nothing happened with her. But Paul preached the truth. And the church has to be so full of faith in the Holy Ghost and the fire of God. We are not, I am not ashamed. What's the word say? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek or the Gentile. I'm not ashamed. Now we try to play watered down Christianity and make everybody happy Christianity and not offend anybody Christianity. Have y'all noticed that the world demands tolerance of everything except what they don't want? You've got to be tolerant of Muslims. You've got to be tolerant of homosexuals. You've got to be tolerant of transgender. You're a white Christian male. Yeah, we're going to stone you to death. Now, right now, that's the worst. Now, then if you go down from there, you could be, uh, you could be a black uh, Christian. But if you're a white Christian male, you are on the, you're, you're the center of the target of the world. 
the liberals, the crazy people. They hate you. They hate your guts. You know? Now, if you're a woman or if you're a, a minority in the, in the populace of America, then they'll, they'll give you a pass to a certain degree. But the second a black man or a black woman stands up against the liberal thing, you're a Tom. Or you're a house servant. I won't use the other word. But you know, what they, you know how to say it. The world demands all this tolerance, and they're demanding of the church, and you've got pastors and priests and leadership all across America bending over and sticking their head in the sand saying, drop, kick me, Satan, through the goalpost of life, and cowing to everything instead of standing up and saying, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Hello? It's the power. Oh, hallelujah. We cannot bring deliverance to men and women being like them. I'm going to grow my hair long. I'm going to get gauges. I'm going to get tatted up. Listen, if you're already tatted up in the world, that's one thing. But the church stopped trying to be the world. Hello? Amen. And everybody, every, nobody listens to the word anymore. Why? Because it's about the individual. I don't know if you notice, everything's about the individual now. The millennials are all about individualism. They're isolated from society. Right. Study them. They're isolated from society. They, uh, they live in a, a video game or a real world video game. They don't, they don't even know how to function in society as a, gen, as a general rule. Okay? But their whole concept is separation from everything, and you live in an alternate state. And the, they're trying to bring that into the church, so the church is like that. And the church can never be an isolated state. It is a community Amen. of believers. It is a company of men and women who come together and hear the gospel and get filled with the Holy Ghost and go out there and reach the world with the power of God. We got to have, we need jail door shaking opening services. We need buildings to shake again. Hello? You go back to the early part of the night, uh, of the last century. That's 20th century, wasn't it? Last part of the 20th century, or early, earlier part of the 20th century, buildings would be on fire and the fire department would come and they couldn't put it, there was no fire to put out. It was the glory of God. Amen. Maria Woodworth Edder stood for three days like this with her Bible. And people came from hundreds of miles away to see this phenomenon. And when she opened her mouth and came out of that state, she picked up right where she had left off. They started a Bible school in, in Palermo, Italy. Anybody know where Palermo is? It's in Sicily. You know what Sicily is? It is the home of the worldwide mafiosa. They went there and started the Bible school. And the thugs of the mafia came and said, you got to pay us protection money. And they said, we're not paying you protection money. They said, you have to. So they're having classes one day, and here they come. They come to show up because they're going to go in there, and they're going to take somebody down, and they're going to prove that you've got to pay. They got to the door and walked up the door, and it's open. And when they got to the opening of the door, they bounced off and fell down. And they got back up, and they ran up there again, bounced off and fell down. And, they, and a couple of them did it, took a couple of trials at it, the running start at it, and finally they just turned around and walked off. And then they saw the head of the Bible school uh, sometime later on that week, and they said, man, we're just going to leave you alone. There's something more powerful in there than what we got. They came in Manila, Manila Philippines. A Raymond graduate was preaching there. She's been all over those islands in the Muslim areas, and the Muslims came to kill her. They brought them machine guns. They came to kill her. They were going to stop her from preaching Jesus. And they walked in the back door. She saw who they were. She knew who they were. And she waved her hand. And they fell to the floor and could not get up. And she finished her sermon. She finished her teaching. She finished what she was doing. And then she pointed at them. And when they released them, they just jumped up and ran out and never saw them again. We need a church that walks like that. Instead of the weenie church. They're, they're going to... They're going to stand outside with protest signs and call us homophobic. <laughs> 1944. 
18 year olds stormed the beaches of Normandy knowing they would die or highly likely would die in that assault. 2016, we have safe zones on college campuses because somebody's speech may hurt my feelings. I'm thinking, all I can think is I am God, I am glad God does not have that generation storming the beaches of Normandy. Amen. Hello. And that spirit is infiltrating the church to emasculate it so it cannot walk in power. And men and women are in need of the power. And Jesus said, don't you do anything. Get your back in somewhere and hang out until the Holy Ghost gets on you. And then when you get the dunamis, you'll be a witness. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Why? Because a church was to go out in power. So my question to you today is, are we the church of Acts today? Or have we compromised everything that the Bible has told us to do for the sake of acceptance and relevance? The Bible is as relevant today as it ever was. Why? Because forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. What does that mean? That means it's eternal. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what's happening in what generation. It doesn't matter what's happening on the planet. The Word of God is settled. It is relevant to every generation just the way it was written. You don't need the Queer James Bible. Just in case you're wondering, there is one. You don't need the feminist Bible. All the pronouns are changed to feminine names. And, and God created the heavens and she... Oh, yeah, it's feminist Bible. You don't need the Bible that takes all the power out of it. You need to stay with that eternal word that will transform the lives of men and women. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Well, did y'all get anything out of that? We, we are, we are called, we're being called up. Listen, I'm, I'm going to share just a couple of minutes with my heart. Um, you know, since we've moved... You know, it's, it's, been, it's been good, but it's also been a, a struggle in one sense financially. There's been some issues. Um, finances have gone down in some places, you know. I mean, and th that, that, that happens, but we, they did. So, I mean, I know some of you think, well, we don't have as much money to spend on the building as we had. Over there. We don't, but we've lost that much money in finances. But I'm saying that to tell you this. We're not going down. Right. Satan's put every kind of pressure you can fathom on us that you, could even, you can't even fathom he's come up with stuff. But you know what? We've got a call. We've got a purpose. We have a ministry and we have an anointing. We must fulfill our destiny. And we're not going to do it. I will shut the doors. Figuratively. Because we can't shut these doors. <laughs> but I will shut the doors and go dig ditches before I will compromise the truth. You can come, here, you can come visit me in the ditch. Let me talk to you. Before we compromise the truth. We will not compromise the truth. Now, I don't believe we're going under. No. I believe we're going over. Amen. I believe we're the head, not the tail. Well, it hadn't looked like it. I can't be moved by what I see. If I was moved by what I saw, I'd be out there digging ditches right now on a Sunday for double time. Hello, you can't go by what you see. You have to go by what God called you to do. Now, all that to say this. We've had a season of transformation. There are days I wake up and think, man, it was nice having a place to meet all the time. We had special meetings. We had, it, was, it was nice. Some of the things we dealt with the last few years wasn't nice. Okay? Um, they still have at least that building out. It's still sitting there empty. So I believe God's called to put us over here, out of there, for a transition to regroup. And we've taken some time off. I think all of us have taken some time off. Kind of, kind of got your wind back in your sails. Kind of, you know, well, praise the Lord, you know, I'm... I, don't have to, I hadn't had to work in the nursery in six months. I hadn't had to do this in six months. I hadn't do, now, we're going to reach our city. We're going to have to get busy. That means you're going to have to get busy witnessing, inviting people, sharing the truth with people, getting, I mean, get them here. Now, I'm not going to say about some hook or crook, just some way, somehow. That was a joke. It's time to get after it. It's time to get 
full of faith and the Holy Ghost again. I'm tired, Pastor. Listen, it's just time to be tired of being tired. And one guy said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen. It's time to re re energize. Well, how am I going to re energize? By praying in the Spirit and allowing the Holy Ghost to energize your inner being. By letting the power and the anointing and the glory of God, hallelujah, it the same Spirit that raised Christ up from the dead dwell in you, it'll quicken, make alive your mortal body. We hadn't been letting the Holy Ghost make alive enough. So I'm calling you to get charged. Listen, I know, I know. This church has been, people individually, we pastorally, I mean, have been under attacks like you. Sometimes I'm like, what in the world? I'm just trying to preach. You know, I just want to go share Jesus with people. Because we have a purpose. What about that church? Doing? I, go ahead on. We have a purpose. We have a calling. And listen, we could be here and say, well, Pastor, how long are we going to be here? We could be here. They seat 350 in the gym. We could move to the gym if we had to. But we can grow and find a place and move instant. We don't have a, we don't have a lease. We go month to month. We just pay them one month at a time. They kind of have it, you know, there's nobody going to come in on Sunday morning. We're here. You know, they're not even open. But now is the time to let the fire burn on you. Some of you, I'm telling you, you need to get your little pitchfork and you need to stir up your ashes and you need to put some wood down there. And you need to go, and then ask the Holy Ghost to help you, let him blow on it. Now, I've cheated before. We've taken like a, like a, a, a pump that you blow mattresses up with that are battery powered. If you're having a hard time getting the fire going, and go down there and go, and all of a sudden it starts going, and you can't, you can't stop. You've got to keep it going. Why? Because eventually it'll get so hot it'll dry that wood out, and then the wood will catch really good. Yeah, I've cheated. Well, it's not really cheating. It's ingenuity. I mean, you're sitting there going, I just smoke, smoke, smoke. Just said, uh, huh? Adapt and overcome. He said, the Holy Ghost is your helper. Let's get in there with God and get the fire of the Holy Ghost once again. So we bring it to church. We bring people to church. You got them loved ones who want to slip out? Just harass them. Get into church. You know you need it. Now get into church with me. Well, I don't want to go so and so. You ain't been going to church anywhere. Don't tell me where you're going. You're going me. I know where to go. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.